everyone, Pastor Daniel here. Welcome to our last Sunday service of the year. It's been chaos, it's been crazy, but guys, we're coming out the other side of 2020 different. And if we didn't have a God who's in control, I would say that's for better or for worse. But because we know him, because we know the kind of God he is, I can safely say we're coming out and it's gonna be for the better. Let's begin our worship service today by hearing from Psalm 147. The psalmist sings praises to God because of what he's done. He's restored Israel. He's not abandoned his people. You'll see in the words here that he restores order and you see the earth working as it should. The poor are cared for. The cities are rebuilt. There's an abundance of food, supplies, children, and prosperity. And right in the middle of this psalm, we'll see the reason for all of this. It's not because horses are strong and can plow fields. It's not because the warrior has conquered the lands and made this happen. It's the Lord who made it happen because of his hesed, his faithful love towards Israel. Roots, God has led us through another year, not because we're perfect, but because he's faithful. Let's hear this Psalm today. Remember his promise. These blessings are, are ours, not because our lives are perfect, but because our God is gracious and he's loving. So let's hear the psalm and meditate on it. Hey Roots, I uh, hope you guys had a Merry Christmas. Uh, today we're going to be reading out of Psalms chapter 147 verses 1 through 20. Um, so let's open our Bibles and let's read this together. God restores Jerusalem. Hallelujah. How good it is to sing to our God, for praise is pleasant and lovely. The Lord rebuilds Jerusalem. He gathers Israel's exiled people. He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. He counts the number of the stars. He gives names to all of them. Our Lord is great, vast in power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord helps the oppressed, but brings the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Play the lyre to our God, who covers the sky with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, and causes grass to grow on the hills. He provides the animals with their food, and the young ravens what they cry for. He is not impressed by the strength of a horse. He does not value the power of a warrior. The Lord values those who fear him, those who put their hope in his faithful love. Exalt the Lord, Jerusalem. Praise your God, Zion, for he strengthens the bars of your city gates and blesses your children within you. He endows your territory with prosperity. He satisfies you with the finest wheat. He sends his command throughout the earth. His word runs swiftly. He spreads snow like wool. He scatters frost like ashes. He throws his hailstones like crumbs. Who can withstand his cold? He sends his word and melts them. He unleashes his winds and the water flows. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and judgments to Israel. He has not done this for every nation. They do not know his judgments. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this passage. <coughs> God, for continuing to um, give us healing, uh, Lord, in this time of uh, the pandemic, and as we are still stuck in our homes for the most part, um, God, we cry to you, we come to you, Lord, uh, because we are brokenhearted, and we do need healing from you, God, uh, both physically and mentally and spiritually, God. Uh, it's been so difficult to stay on top of everything, um, just being stuck in our homes, um, not being able to do the same uh, rhythms and routines that we're used to. Um, and God, we also pray that um, we would understand that you don't look for those who are strong. God, that it's those who are weak, those who lean on you, who you um, lift up, who you bless, God. And so would you help us to be a people who know how to lean on you, who know how to rely on you, and not to just have pride in ourselves and think that we're able to do everything ourselves with our own strength. Because um, God, truly it is you who provides for us. Um, so Lord, as we continue this season, of um, the pandemic as vaccines are coming out. Lord, would you help us to <coughs> not to rely on ourselves or our own strengths, but God, to rely on you who will provide for us uh, safety, vaccinations, food, everything, God. 
Um, we thank you so much, Lord, that you promised this to us. Uh, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, guys. Today is the last Sunday of the year. Isn't that crazy? It, 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 it's starting next week. It's 2021. The year just... I mean, I wouldn't say the year flew by, but it's just crazy that we've come to the end of the year. I, I think it'll be good for us to spend some time in reflection. This being our, our last service of 2020, I want us to look back over our year. See, everyone and everything in life needs a checkup to make sure it's being maintained well. A car needs a diagnostic check every now and then. Our vacuum cleaner and air filter need to get checked out to have the filter replaced. Your own body should have a checkup uh, for, at a doctor apparently every three years. I, I did not know that. Um, I need to go more often. If you don't get these checkups, your car can break down. Your vacuum cleaner uh, can start to have problems. There might be something wrong that... Uh, wrong with your body that you're not aware of until it's too late. A checkup takes uh, takes a look at very ordinary basic functions in your car, your body, or something else. These seem like really negligible things. You just assume that the, for the most part, everything is working as it should. But it's important to get these things checked out before stuff goes wrong or there are really heavy consequences for ignoring it. You have to check before you run into bigger problems down the line. If you don't, be ready to pay the price. Literally, like buying a new car part or uh, buying a new car part or a car or paying a huge hospital bill is going to be crazy expensive. That's a that's the price you pay. Our faith is no different. I think every new year when we begin to look over our lives, we need a checkup. We need an opportunity to look back and take a good look at our spiritual lives with God. It's important for us to do a checkup of things that might seem basic, but we don't want to take but if we don't take a good hard look at them and just assume that everything's working fine, we're going to find ourselves in a lot of trouble down the line. So the question I want to answer is, what are areas of our faith that we need a spiritual checkup in? What are parts of our spiritual life that we believe we're doing just fine, but we might be assuming too much, and we need to take a, take a look before we run into problems later on? Okay, I've got two basic things that I want us to look at. Two basic things. And before I mention them, I need to preface this. You might think, oh, this is just basic stuff. The moment I mention these two topics, these two beliefs, you might be tempted to click off or open another tab because you think in your head, I already know this. I don't need to check up on this. And I warn you, that's so dangerous because there are so many ways that this checkup will reveal there might be a malfunction here in your belief. So let's start with the checkup. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. We're going to read verses 16 to 17. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. We're going to skip to chapter 3 and read verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, so Paul is, not afraid, uh, Paul is not ashamed of the gospel here because it's the power to save. And that first part that he starts off with is um, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay? All have sinned and fallen short. And the first thing that I think we need a diagnostic check for is our belief that we're sinners. Our belief that we're sinful. I think there are a number of us, we don't think we're that bad. When we look at Romans 3.23 and, say, and it says, all have sinned and fallen short, I think we look at that verse and think, okay, I accept it as a doctrine. We think, yes, that's what I believe as a concept, but deep down, I don't think we're there in terms of believing it in our hearts. There's a few ideas that we believe instead of this verse. Here's a few of them. I'm going to list them out here, and I want you to take a good hard look at this past year and reflect 
if you're believing any of these things that I'm about to list, instead of our verse of Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, you need to you need to go through this checkup. You need to make sure that everything's in order, okay? First thing is this, comparing sin. Instead of believing that we're sinful, I think we believe if someone else is worse than I am, I don't really need to worry about my own sin. If someone else is more sinful than me, my sins aren't that bad. I don't need to feel, uh, I don't need to repent of my sins when I see someone else is so much worse. There have been times where I believed that I was a sinner, but because I was considering someone else's sins worse than mine, I did not repent of my own sins. Because I see my own sins as smaller than that other guy, I don't think I'm all that bad. So I would stop confessing my sins to God and I set my standard to just be, well, as long as I'm not as low as these other people, then I don't need to repent to God. No, I mean, I, I never said that out loud, but that's what I was doing in my heart. Here's the diagnostic check I want us to do on ourselves. Ask yourself, is there anyone in your life that you consider more sinful than you? So when you look at their sins, it makes you feel like, I don't need to repent. Or, mm, my sins aren't that bad. If, you, if someone were to catch you in your sins and confront you in your sin, what would you say the words, well, dude, I'm not... At least I'm not this guy. Oh, man, you can't compare me to them. Come on. This, this is sin that we are not considering as sin. But it's sin all the same. And that's the checkup that we need to be doing. There is sin in your life that you are no longer considering sin. That we, we, are, we have found a gas leak in your belief system here. And, and we need to, to work on fixing it. So let, let's move on. There, let's see what other ways that we start to get this concept of sin in our life that we don't consider sin anymore. Okay, here's another one. Blaming sin on others. Blaming sin on others. We tell God, look, God, that, that one's not my fault. God, those other girls were the ones who wanted to isolate that person. They, they wanted to shun her. That wasn't my idea. God, it was the spam that made me fall into sin. That's not me. God, I only did this because they started this whole thing. They made me react in that terrible, sinful way, but they're the ones who initially started it out. Guys, if you were part of a group that wanted to do something horrible to someone else, that wanted to isolate this person, that wanted to, that wanted to shun her, and you did nothing to stop it, you might have not liked it, but you went along with it. You have sinned against this person. This person whom you've, I don't know, maybe torn out of your friend group or you thought was strange, so you isolate them. That person needed someone righteous. That person needed someone to protect them. And now, when we didn't, when we didn't stand up for that, now that person has every right to call out to God, the God of justice to bring her justice against you. If you were tempted to sin and you gave into the sin rather than running to God, if you've sinned so much, uh, if you've continued to sin and you ignore this, uh, the problems that this is creating and now you grow more and more numb to the sin, you no longer go to God to repent, beware of this, that, that this sin is seeking to separate you from the Lord and it's doing it. If there is unrepented sin in your life that you no longer consider to be a big deal because you've just kept doing it over and over and your your soul is becoming numb to this, be on the lookout. Beware of this kind of sin. How, how about this? Let's keep going down the line. The treat yourself, the treat yourself to sin, okay? This is where we experience something difficult or when we're going through something and we give ourselves an out to sin, Oh, we've had a hard day, or 2020 was so hard, God, can't you cut me some slack? The logic of this is, because I went through this, Lord, you should let me indulge in this sin. God, you should let this sin slide because I went through all this other cruddy stuff this year. The problems with this kind of thinking here is... Um, uh, it, it, it's a little bit crazy, okay? We are bargaining with God to get our sin. 
that's that's crazy. Like we are asking for a deal from God where the prize that we get is our sin, the sin that separates from God, the sin that condemns us to eternal damnation and separates us from eternal life, the sin that's caused so much damage, the sin that we see ravaging the world in celebrity scandals, political corruption, horrible sins that people have committed around the world. We are asking God to let us indulge in that, in our anger, in our lust, in our self-pity of 2020. God offers eternal life and freedom from sin and joy, and we bargain to let him allow us to sin. Uh, we got that's sinful. We need to check ourselves on that. Okay, how, I'm going to keep moving down the list here. What about private sin? If my sin isn't affecting anyone else, if my sin is private, well, why is it bad? Because... We aren't seeing anyone, you know, we're living in quarantine because we're spending a lot of time alone. We're not experiencing the consequences of sin immediately when we do something wrong. We feel that we can hide this sin from the world, so we don't think it's all that bad. Common phrases I hear about this kind of sin is, well, it's not hurting anyone. Why should it be so bad? Because we feel like we can sin in private and we don't see any immediate consequences, we don't see the need to repent for it. And here's the problem. The main problem with all of these things that I've listed, the main problem with sin isn't that it's against other people. The main problem with sin is that it's against God. When King David, when King David morally failed and committed adultery with Bathsheba, he writes in Psalm 51, He says an interesting line. He says, against you and you alone have I sinned. What's that mean? What's he talking about there? Against you and you alone have I sinned. It's this, I mean, uh, it's such a strange concept, right? Because David clearly sinned against Uriah. uh, There's there's a man, in order to get what David wanted, he had to murder Bathsheba's husband in order to take Bathsheba as his wife. So uh, Bathsheba's husband was Uriah the Hittite. He sends him out into battle, tells everyone to draw away from him so that he gets killed in battle, and then goes and marries this man's wife. Now that's terribly sinful, right? Now, he, he's not, but, but then he says this line in Psalm 51, against you and you alone have I sinned. David is not saying that Bathsheba and her husband were not affected by this sin. His sin was horrible and it changed their lives forever. But he's saying, what David is saying here is that the greatest offense that David did wasn't against man, it was against God. The problem with private sin is that we think it's not hurting anyone. We think there are no consequences for it. We think we can sin, and as long as we can get away with it, it's fine. But it's not. What we've forgotten is that sin happens in a relationship with God. All sin happens in a relationship with Him. And what we don't understand is that sin breaks unity in this relationship, and it destroys communion with God. There is, uh, let me put it this way, there, there's no one that I love more than my wife. I mean, God will always come first on that list, right? But other than God, there is no one I love more than her. And because I love her, I've made a covenant with her in our marriage. I have promised to care for her, to exclusively belong to her. Now, if I were to sin against her and go against that promise, and I, um, if I were to commit adultery... And that would cause unimaginable pain, and that would spit on everything that I promised to her. You might say, "Uh, Pastor Daniel, that's not a private sin. That's a sin within a relationship with your wife. That sin is harmful because it's happening against your wife. That's what I'm trying to say. There is no sin that's private. There is no sin that's only to ourselves. All our sin happens in our relationship and our commitment to God. God has entered into a covenant with us. He was willing to give up his one and only son to make that covenant. And when we consider our sins to not be hurting anyone, when we consider our sins private, 
we are forgetting that our sins are in the context of that covenant with the Lord. The person that we hurt most for our sins is God. Sin is against our loving God, who is willing to sacrifice so much so that we can be redeemed. When we say that our sin doesn't affect anyone, we forget that uh, actually that's the sin that Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross for. When we say that our sins are to ourselves, we forget that Jesus faced the consequences of our sin so that we would not have to face God's wrath. Your sin isn't private. It's the reason why Jesus hung on the cross. So, diagnostic check. Are there sins in your life that you've stopped considering sins? Are there sins that you're no longer repenting of because you compare yourself to others, or you think it's private, or you think it's someone else's fault, or you think God should let you indulge in self-sabotaging sin? Does Romans 3.23 hit different when you know how deep your sin goes? And if this is you, come back to the gospel truth. God knew you. God knows what's in your heart. God knows the sin you're harboring. And he says, come to me and I'll kill that sin that's killing you. God invites us to come to him and find forgiveness in Jesus Christ. There's mercy here. Okay, so let's continue with the checkup. I'll give you another diagnosis. What are areas of our faith that we need a spiritual checkup? My second point is this, our belief that we're loved by God. We need a diagnostic check that we, we, that we actually believe that we're loved and accepted by God. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And we're, we're going to keep skipping around here. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 to 11. And then uh, Romans chapter 6, 23. And then Romans 10, 9, 13. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, will we, will we be saved through him from wrath? For if while we were enemies, we were rec reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? And not only that, but because we... Uh, but but all, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received, uh, we have now received this reconciliation. And I skip to chapter six, verse twenty-three. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Chapter ten, verse nine to nine to thirteen. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. No, uh, one who believes with the heart resulting in righteousness and one confesses uh, with the mouth resulting in salvation. For the scripture says everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. Since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay, so that was a lot that we went through. Let me explain all that. God, it, it, when we come back to Romans 5, God proves his love even when we were still sinners, even when we were still unrighteous. He loved us enough to come and die for us. God's love didn't come after it was before. God saw you while you were still lost. God saw you while you were still sinning and loved you. It wasn't that God died for us and then he loved us. It was that God loved us even though we were rebellious against him, living sinfully, and he loved us enough to send his one and only son to die for us. And the Bible tells us that we're saved by God. We're saved by Christ and his work, not our own. It's only through Jesus Christ that we receive God's forgiveness. We earn Nothing. Nothing. You don't earn anything. God's forgiveness is given. It's not earned. The only thing we can do is call on the name of Jesus and we're saved. That's it. Simple. That's the gospel standard. That's God's standard. You're a sinner. You're lost. Come to me and I will save you. Believe in the name of Jesus and you're saved. Uh, I'm not sure if we really buy it. 
I'm not sure if we really buy into it completely. In some ways, we don't. Like, I know in my head, I believe it. But in my heart, I know there's another standard that I might be living by. In my head, I get it. But my heart thinks different. And I think, as an Asian American, you might feel the same way. You might be living with another standard that you're putting above the gospel standard. And let me tell you what that standard is. This past Thursday, Esther tried making carbonara pasta. Okay, and if you haven't tried, uh, if you haven't uh, seen any YouTube videos on the thing, you would think that carbonara pasta is a pasta with a cream sauce, with bacon. But it's not. It's not. Real Italian carbonara is actually eggs mixed with Parmesan cheese and pepper and guanciale. It's like a, like a Italian sangiapsar. And you might think, but Pastor Daniel, if it's just a bunch of eggs and cream. Uh, if it's just a bunch of eggs and no cream, how do you get the sauce to be creamy? Won't it just be scrambled egg noodles? Great question, myself. Uh, the answer is put the pan on low heat, put pasta water, and then when you add the eggs cheese mixture, stir like crazy before the eggs have a chance to harden into scrambled eggs. If you stir fast enough and you keep the heat low enough, you will create a cream sauce instead of scrambled eggs. So Esther spent the day shaving Parmesan cheese for 15 minutes and preparing all the ingredients and then asked me to come out and help on the last part. And I prepared the noodles and I got ready to stir the pot really fast. I, I put the eggs in and I start stirring and the pan was too hot and I made scrambled egg noodles. Uh, no cream sauce. It was dry. It was sticking together. Ugh, it, and I got so mad at myself for messing it up. Because Esther put in all this work, and I just showed up at the end and ruined it. I was so mad at myself. It seems so petty, right? I, I was so mad at myself for messing up her effort. And Esther and her mom kept saying, you know, Daniel, it, it's okay. It, it tastes good. It's okay, Daniel. I couldn't hear them. Okay, I, I heard them. Like, I physically heard them, but I didn't believe them. I was still so mad at myself. I wasn't okay with messing this up, even though they had already forgiven me. I was putting my own standard above their standard of me. Have you ever been so focused on your own standard of yourself that you can't hear what anyone else says to you? Have you ever been so focused on what you did wrong, you can't hear the voices that are telling you that you're forgiven, that everything is all right, despite the fact that you fell short? It could be that you didn't do well on your grades and you would have liked that you didn't do as well on your grades as you would have liked to, and your parents tell you it's okay, but you hate yourself for letting them down. It could be that you messed up your friendship and your friends have forgiven you, but you can't bring yourself to hang out with them like before because you still haven't forgiven yourself. It could be that you were let go of your job and you feel like your family is struggling and it's all your fault and they still love you, but you can't accept their love until you get your job back. You put a standard of yourself above what everyone else will say about you. There's too much shame for you to accept anyone else's view of you. You have to redeem yourself. You have to make it right. You have to save yourself. You put your standard of yourself above what everyone else will say about you. There's too much shame. And we do this with God. We put our standard of ourselves over God's standard of us. When God says we're forgiven and we don't feel like we should be forgiven, we don't feel like we deserve that love, we don't believe that God loves us. Even though the Bible tells us we don't earn God's favor. When God says he loves us, we don't feel like, and we don't feel like we deserve that love. We say to ourselves, how can God love me when I can't even love myself? We agree, yeah, I don't earn God's love. Yeah, Jesus loves me. I believe that. The Bible tells me that. But we, then we fail in something. When we don't do well in our life or we sin, we immediately put our standard of ourselves above God's standard of us. We think we need to be perfect, and it's not okay for us to be loved by God unless we deserve it. Roots. It is sinful when God tells you that he loves you in Jesus Christ 
and you say to him, no, God, you can't let, you can't love me until I meet my own standards. It is prideful for you to look at God's perfect standard as Jesus, and then to say, I need to meet my own standard above Jesus's work for me. As if your standard was more perfect than Jesus's on the Jesus' work on the cross for you. You are loved by God, and you are completely undeserving of it. That's the point of the gospel. You don't earn it. Even though we know we're sinful, even though we we know, uh, even though we know we don't believe it, we need to open ourselves up to what God is calling us to. There's a powerful song. Uh, you've sung it. You've sung it in kids too, seventh graders, and um, we've also sung it in Roots. There's a, a song called "Who You Say I Am," and there's a part in the bridge that says, "I am who you say I am, God. I am who you say I am." I'm not who I call myself. I'm not defined by my own standard of myself. I'm defined by who you call me. God, your standard is the one that matters. You're the standard that I live by. Your words declare who I am. I might be a sinner, but because of your son's work on the cross, you call me perfect. You call me worthy. You call me valuable. Roots, I need you to pray to God. If you've been putting your own standard of yourself above God's standard of you, I need you to pray that God will help you see you are not what you call yourself when you fail. You are who God calls you to be. You are who God says you are. The two areas that I really want us to see are this. I didn't create the first part of this sermon because I wanted you to go away from this sermon feeling like garbage. The good news of the gospel is this. You are more sinful than you think you are, but you're more loved by God than you think you are. You're more sinful than you believe you are because there might be sins that you've no longer considered sins, but you're more loved by God than you think you are because God's grace and love has been covering you even when you're unaware of it. There are sins that you need to start confessing for. There are sins that you need to begin repenting of. But you can be sure God has been waiting for you to come clean. God has been waiting to forgive you. God has loved you this whole time. He hasn't stopped. Roots, let's give ourselves this yearly check on our spiritual lives. Let's come before God and confess our sins. And then let's celebrate that we're forgiven in the gospel. We don't earn it. He's given it to us, and you are now defined not by who you call yourself, but by who he says you are. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much for the gospel. Lord, somehow there are sins in our life that we no longer consider sins. And I pray, God, that you help us to see what we're missing. You open our eyes to those sins that are festering in our hearts, that are causing us to turn away from you. Lord, we also pray if there's anyone here that feels like they're undeserving of your love, Help us always to come back to knowing the gospel standard. There is nothing higher than the gospel standard to hold ourselves to. There is nothing higher for us to hold us to than the work of your son on the cross. You have won it all for us. You have done it all for us. And now we can live in confidence because it's not about who we make ourselves out to be. Your acceptance isn't based on how deserving we are. It's based on what your son has done for us on the cross. We are who you say we are. Your opinion is the one that matters. Help us to believe this. Help us to check our lives and make sure that we're moving forward rightly. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Right now, we're going to respond to God's word. 
We're going to sing praises to him, and we're going to give our offering. If you have your offering, mail it in uh, or drop it off uh, right now. Let's give our the, the, the breath in our lungs to the Lord, and let's sing praises about this good news. We are defined by him. I am who you say I am, Father. Who am I? Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me and know oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me, whom the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Free at last, he has ransomed me, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. While we were still, yes, he died for me. Whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. Not what anyone else says. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Only his word counts. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Whom the sun sets free. I'm a child of God, yes I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me I'm a child of God Yes, I am Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for another day of worship. As we reflect on the last Sunday of 2020, I pray for your insight and wisdom to enter our hearts. I pray that we can look back on this year and recognize the work you have been doing in our lives. It was a hard year for many of us, and many of us have felt the distance between ourselves and what we were used to on a regular basis. School, friends, extracurriculars, anything but this. We would never have imagined this for ourselves, but may we keep in mind that there is plenty more that you have in store for us, much of it also unimaginable. May we remember that you are indeed our eternal hope, and may 2021 also be yours to work in. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey everyone, it's time for announcements. I hope you're able to join us this past week for our daily devotionals for Christmas. Christmas is such a special time for us Christians and it's meant to affect our hearts. But when we use the break to do everything else but worship him, our hearts can go 
grow cold towards this opportunity to celebrate God and love Him for what He's done. So if you haven't gotten the opportunity, those devotionals will stay up. Spend some time listening while you go for a walk. Listen first thing when you wake up under a warm blanket to start your day. Um, and just uh, listen to those devotionals. Set your mind on the Lord. Uh, even though Christmas has passed, they're, they're still good to, to get us into that mindset of knowing what this season is about. Now, with Christmas passing, we'll be going into the new year this week. We're going to have a New Year's Eve countdown on Zoom. We're just going to use the same Zoom link as Friday Night Room. But again, it's not happening on Friday. It's happening on Thursday night at 10.30 p.m join us. We're just going to play a few games together, and then I want to lead us in a couple of prayer topics as we go into the new year. For as long as I can remember, I've always been able to celebrate New Year's with my church. I don't want this year to be any different, and I don't want anyone to feel like they have to celebrate New Year's alone this year. Come join us, play a few games, have some fun, pray with us, be with your church, and let's look to the Lord together, and let's welcome 2021 in together as a family. Uh, again, spend New Year's focusing on your loved ones this Friday. There won't be a Friday night this week, so no need to rush to finish your huge dinners. Be present with your family. I even challenge you, ask your family if you can pray for the meal and thank God uh, for them and his provision this year, his love to be even clearer to your family this year than the last year. That being said, our Friday nights can start up, well, will start up again next year. We'll be starting with more than just Q&A. Our root staff have been working out different approaches that we can take, so we'll announce topics that we'll be covering for the week, such as outreach activities, praise and prayer nights, book studies, teachers' testimonies, fellowship nights, uh, topics, and more. We'll be announcing week to week what our Friday nights will be covering from here on out, so stay tuned for that down the line. And there are no small groups today. For the next two weeks, we'll be spending dinner table. We'll be sending dinner table questions to your parents to discuss what your plans are for the new year, things that you've learned about yourself, or one thing you've learned about God this year that impacted you. And I know that it can feel a little bit strange to discuss personal questions with the family, but I hope this is a start. You see, our faith isn't only meant to stay in church. It's meant to touch every part of our life, including the space that we spend the most time in, and that is our family. How we treat and interact our, with our parents, our siblings, our loved ones, that has everything to do with our faith. So let's take that first huge step and begin walking in faith with our families by just having a, a casual conversation about faith and God at the dinner table. That's all that we have for today, everyone. We'll see you guys next week for our New Year's service. Bye, guys.